Good morning. How are you doing? Ah, oh, it's good to be here in Cancun in this cold winter weather. It's crazy, right? So I was in DC just the other week, and we had to close the whole federal government because it was too windy, a little bit too cold. And now I'm here, and it's winter here in Mexico, and slightly different temperature. So anyway, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about a brief history of disinformation. I have 30 minutes to tell you all about disinformation, the whole history of it. Otherwise, I'm going to get shot. I mean, this is very controversial. I come to a Russian conference, first thing they tell me is they're going to shoot me, right? So uh, for those of you that uh, don't know me, my name is Pone All The Things. Uh, my friends sometimes call me Matt. Matt Tate is the name on my passport, which is useful for buying alcohol mainly, uh, occasionally for going between countries. Uh, for those of you that are on Twitter, you probably know me as Pone All The Things. You should be tweeting. If you're not currently tweeting, you're doing it wrong. You should be hashtagging your tweets with hashtag the SAS2018. If you're not on Twitter, there's 30 minutes in which you can sign up. So it's good. So this here is one of my favorite graphics. This is a graphics of Twitter interactions during the 2014 Gaza uh, uh, Israeli conflict. And one of the things that's really great about it is you can really see the different echo chambers of the different groups of people that are interacting. You can see how you, know, you have pro-Gaza, you can see how you have pro-Israeli, you can see how you have different groups interacting with each other, and how they really sort of get sucked into interacting with people that they agree with. They're not interacting with everyone. This is one of the things that we'll see is very important when it comes to information warfare. So, what is information warfare and fake news? Why do we care about it? What is this fake news, right? Why is it in the media all the time, right? It's not new. Well, it's in the media all the time because of this guy, right? You know this guy, Donald J. Trump. He's a big fan of this new word, fake news. And in fact, it became word of the year last year, according to one of the dictionaries. Now, very controversially, they actually had 10 words of the year, which I think is cheating. But fake news was their top one which, again, is fake news, because it's actually two words. So they screwed up there. Uh, they also had a different one as well, which was echo chamber, which also is relevant. I guess it's controversial whether that's two words or one word with a hyphen, so we'll give them that one. And this up here it says, the organization sought in part to conduct what it called information warfare. Does anyone recognize that? That's from Robert Mueller's indictment just a couple of weeks ago. This was the Internet Research Agency. Apparently, they were conducting information warfare against the United States. So what is this word disinformation? Disinformation is a very old word. It comes from the 1950s. And the cool thing about it, one of my favorite things about disinformation is the word itself is disinformation. Right? It comes from this Russian word, desinformatsia, and it was coined by Joseph Stalin himself. And he chose this word very carefully. He had a whole bunch of different words that he could choose, and he chose this one because it sounded, it had a Latin root. It sounded French. And as a Brit, I can 100% endorse blaming things on the French. So there's a cool bit of history there. So when I was looking at the history of disinformation, one of the things that I was looking for was how far back can you go? When was the earliest piece of disinformation that you can come across, right? So you can go back to the Soviets, and you can go further, you can go back to the Nazis, you can go further back from there, you can go back to the Potomkin villages of the 18th century, you can go further back, you can go all the way back to the Romans. But this is the earliest form of disinformation I could find. 3,000 years ago, by this guy. Does anyone know who he is? This is Ramesses II. And this guy, well, he had a couple of conflicts with people, right? Some of them very famous conflicts, some of them less famous conflicts. He was the ruler of this big green area, which included Egypt. And he wasn't friends with the ruler of this big red area, which was ruled by the Hittites. And they had a big war. And they had this big war at Kadesh 
which is near Lake Homs, which is the site of other conflicts. And the problem was that they had this big fight there, and they fought to a stalemate. And that's really not that inspiring. And the cool thing is, we actually have documents. We have the ceasefire agreement from 1293 BCE. We know that it ended with a stalemate. But that's really uninspiring if you are the pharaoh and you want to get into the afterlife. Right? You need to persuade the other gods that you're really good at fighting, and stalemates are not you being good at fighting. So you need to trick the gods into thinking you're really good at fighting. And how do you do that? With a tomb. And so he created Luxor. Right? And what does he do? He paints on the inside of his inner chamber, look, look how great I am at fighting. I had this huge battle. And my forces were dreadful, but I personally intervened and defeated them massively. He is the Donald Trump of 1293 BCE. <laughs> so, if we zoom forwards a bit, if we really want to understand disinformation in the context of, say, the 2016 election, which, of course, is where most people think when they think of disinformation, we really need to understand a little bit about 20th century information warfare. And really, this is a super, super summarized version. I don't want to get headshotted, so I won't go into too much detail here. But essentially, you end up with, after the printing press comes along, you end up with this vile document, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is an extremely anti-Semitic document that gets printed and distributed through a lot of Western Europe. And this arrives in the United States in 1917, which for those of you that know your Russian history, is the time when the Russian Revolution was taking place. And it comes to the United States as part of the Red Scare. What they do is they look through this document and they replace the word Jew with the word Bolshevik. And that's sufficient to persuade everyone in the United States that it's legit. <laughs> so there's no Russophobia in the United States anymore, right? We've put this all to, to rest, maybe. Uh, so anyway, when we see mass media start to come out, we start to see nation states taking advantage of it. And really, it's the Nazi regime that sort of industrializes disinformation. And after them, the Soviet Union and the German Stasi in particular. We have some quotes here. This, is, this guy here, Colonel Rolf Wagenbreth, he was the head of the East German Stasi and their Active Measures Department X, who was the head of that department for 20 years. So he knows what he's talking about. And this is the way that he does information warfare. This is the way that he thinks about information warfare. From his perspective, He's looking for cracks in someone else's society, and he's going to drive a wedge through them. Right? He's not going to create the cracks, but he's going to exploit them. Does anyone recognize that from recently? Right, this was back in the 50s. Right? And also we have here Zer Setsung. Right? This was a scientific document. We have it from the Stasi archives. This was in 1976. This is the psychological destruction of people using information because they're getting in the way. This is what information warfare is. This is what information warfare looks like. So why does it work? Why, why does it work, right? We all know how we consume information. You get a bunch of data, you look at it, you statistically analyze it, then having worked out what's true, that's how you make all your decisions, right? That's how everyone makes decisions. No, well, maybe not. It turns out that people suck at making decisions, right? Controversial, I know. And there's three themes which really come out when we're looking at information warfare. The first here is this thing called tribalism or partisanship. We see this a lot in the United States, but not just in the United States. That what happens is that people are predisposed to believing that their friends, their colleagues, people that they identify with, those are good people. So in the event that they screw up, that's just, you know, a minor problem that, you know, they, they were acting mostly in good faith and occasionally they screw up. Whereas the people on the other side, on the, on the other group, those people are assholes, 
right? They're the worst people. Can you imagine? Everything that they do is secretly trying to destroy your group, right? So what happens is information comes in, and your assessment as to whether you believe it or not is colored by this thing called tribalism. The second thing is confirmation bias. Now, I think of confirmation bias as really a very, very narrow form of partisanship. It is the group of one. It is, I believe that what I think is probably the best way of thinking about it, which is probably why I'm thinking about it, right? Information comes in, and if I agree with it, that proves I'm right. And if information comes in and it disagrees with what I think, then that's probably bad information, right? We all do it. That's how it works. This third one is surprisingly relevant today, is the indefatigability of debunked ideas. It's a very complicated way of saying, we expect ideas that are dumb, that everyone knows are false, will eventually leave the discourse. And it turns out that if they don't leave the discourse, we get confused by that. We say, well, if everyone's still confused whether or not Trump and Russia colluded when there's an email that says that they did, then maybe there isn't, right? We get confused. Because in the event that you say a lie enough times, eventually people come to believe it. So disinformation became this really big deal. Well, it became a big deal before the Cold War, but it became this sort of industrial exercise during the Cold War. Now, I managed to find these reports uh, in declassified CIA documents. They didn't expect these to come out. And this here at the bottom is the CIA director, or the deputy director, and here's uh, a briefing of the House Intelligence Committee in the United States. And he says that the Soviet Union was spending three to four billion dollars on disinformation in 1980s dollars, right? Now, if I am you, like, you probably shouldn't trust what the CIA is saying here, right? The CIA has a nasty habit of inflating numbers, especially when they're going to Congress, because they're asking Congress for money, right? So this is a little bit of a dubious number. But the point is, this is a big number. In 1980s dollars, that's $12.6 billion, right, in today money. Like, that's the whole budget of the NSA right there, being spent on disinformation against the United States. This is big business. This isn't people messing around. So, what happens when we zoom on a little bit? Right? We've talked a little bit about disinformation in the olden days. What about disinformation once we start looking at computers? In information warfare via the cybers. Can anyone guess what this graphic is? I've already showed you the echo chambers and how information flows in the Gaza-Israeli conflict. This here is the Harlem Shake, right? This is how the Harlem Shake goes across the internet. You have the different groups, the different social networks. One of those is YouTube, another one is Twitter, another one is Facebook, right? So it turns out there's a lot of interaction there. So. When I was in Israel, I was a little bit careful not to point this one out. But it uh, turns out that Mossad has been doing uh, uh, information operations with computers for a long time, since at least the mid-1990s. What did they do? They hacked into Fatah, right? And what they did was they hacked some of their accountants, and they moved money from one account to a different account. They didn't steal the money, they just shuffled it between different accounts. Why did they do that? Because then all of the FATO administrators said, that bastard there has stolen my money. This is an active measure. It's not by Russia, but this is an active measure. It's an information operation, because they're using information to affect a real-world outcome. This is in the mid-1990s. So those of you that were at SAS last year, shout out if you were at SAS last year. A fair number. So you'll remember things like Moonlight Maze. And this was a, a big Russian hacking operation in the mid-1990s. This was 1995. This was happening about the same sort of time when nation states as big as Russia were just about learning how to hack. Mossad was like, ha, we already know this domain. We're all over it, right? Maybe the Russians learned from them, or maybe they learned, I don't know. So 
Anyway, a little bit more recently, we have 2014, the Ukrainian election hack. This was after the Maidan event. So uh, uh, for those of you that have forgotten, uh, the Ukrainian uh, president Yanukovych was ousted from power. And what happened was they held elections. And the Russian government wasn't super happy with that. And so what they did was they hacked a bunch of people and they released some of the documents. And some of the documents were leaked via this distributor here called CyberBurkut, who many of you already know. CyberBurkut is this really interesting distributor of APT's 28 documents. And they're really interesting because they edit the documents before they post them. How do we know that they edit these documents? Well, I mean, I don't really need to tell this group. We have lots of forensic capabilities to tell that specific documents have been edited. But better than that, we actually, they released the documents twice. And they had two different distributors. They had the DC Leaks distributors, and they had the CyberBurka distributors. And they both distributed the same document, apart from CyberBurka one was doctored, and the DC Leaks one wasn't. So what do we do? We diff them and say, what have they changed? And look, it's all of this amazing, like, hyper-political stuff for elites in Russia. How convenient. Right? This is information warfare, right? And pro tip for next time, maybe like try not to suck up your information operation by releasing the unredacted versions and the redacted versions at the same time. <sighs> Rookie mistake. So we get to 2016 and the hack and release of all of this information from the DNC. So lots of you know me from Twitter. Some of you will know this guy from Twitter, Guccifer2. Of all of the followers I have, he's my favorite. Right? He's great. Um, what this guy did was he started releasing some of the documents from inside the DNC's network. He started doing this a single day after CrowdStrike comes online and says, the DNC has been hacked, and they've been hacked by Russia. And this guy comes along and says, nope, it wasn't hacked by Russia, it's hacked by me. I'm a Romanian. Right? Sounds legit. <laughs> so we ended up with conversations with him. And people would say, OK, you sound like you're a Romanian, because you say you are. Let's have a conversation in Romanian. And he says, oh, I don't really speak it, though. <laughs> so yeah, he did his best. Give him credit. Um, if he's watching, you give that guy a bonus. Right? That guy did a good job. Um, <laughs> This, this guy here is Wikileaks. They're my email provider. Um, <laughs> the, Wikileaks was responsible for the second part of the operation. Actually, there was a series of different threads of operations, multiple distinct streams. We tend to think of this 2016 election hacking as this single monolith, right? that someone somewhere in FSB headquarters with an enormously complicated whiteboard planned this all out very carefully. No, that's not what happened. There's multiple different streams, and some of these streams were more successful than others. right? So the first set of events that took place was this DC leaks operation. This DC leaks operation was the hack and release of people like General Breedlove's emails uh, and White House intern emails. Then you had this main thread that people have spent a lot of time looking at, people like me, um, which is the hack and release of DNC information. Initially, this was things like the Trump opposition research. And then you had things like uh, the DNC emails themselves, which were released in bulk through WikiLeaks. But then you had this very interesting one towards the end, which was the hack and release of John Podesta's emails. He was fished. We know from forensics on that email that this was an APT28 campaign, and that these emails were released every single day from mid-October, one release a day until the day after the election. And everyone freaked out. It was crazy. And it was this really interesting style, a sort of tsunami leak style. And then you have this final one, this one that uh, Special Counsel Mueller has been investigating, this Project Lacta, which is this internal name of this operation by the Internet Research Agency, where they're using things like Twitter, things like Facebook, to try and persuade people directly. One of the interesting things, of course, is that 
as we saw before, you know, back with the Soviet times, they're not just playing one site, they're playing both sites. Here we have a great graph of uh, uh, Russian Twitter bots and their ideologies in the two different echo chambers. Sometimes these are the same people who are tweeting on both sides, right? Why are they tweeting on both sides? Because they're trying to drive a wedge between them, right? They're not trying to create cracks, they're trying to drive a wedge through cracks that already exist. This is fundamentally the reason why the 2016 election activity was so successful. The United States is a very fractured society. It's very easy to manipulate. So, what can we do about it? That's a much harder question. It's really easy to see what the problems are. It's much harder to ask what we can do about it. The first thing is that a lot of journalists were spending a huge amount of time when every one of these new email dumps was coming out. And what they had to do is they had to say, first of all, is there anything new in here that is newsworthy? And second of all, is there anything in here which has been forged? This is the real difficulty of information operations, as we know that other countries forge documents and edit documents before they release. So what we really need is we need better ways of much more quickly identifying forged information. If we can do that quickly and automated, then journalists are not having to go through that information. And the problem is that there's a finite bandwidth, not just for the public, but for journalists. And if a journalist is spending four hours a day looking at these emails, they are going to write stories about them. Right? That's how journalists work. Right? If you ask them to do work, they're going to try and write a story about it. We also need to be quite careful with the way that we build social networks. We've spent a lot of time building these social networks, assuming that they're very reliable and that only, the only people using them are ordinary users. Right, maybe a couple of bots, but mostly normal users. And it turns out that there's a lot of bots, and some of those bots are owned by governments. Some of those bots are owned by things like QAnon. Right? Some of them are owned by alt-right groups. These people are using their bots strategically. One of the things they're going to do is they're going to use community reputation. They're going to use that to silence views that they don't like. In the event that 20 people report your tweet as being you know, uh, offensive, and that Twitter says, OK, 20 people have reported it as offensive. I'm going to suspend your account until someone comes in and proves otherwise. Well, you only need 20 bots to ban any account, right? These types of tools, we think that they're cool, but they're just secret admin tools for people that have bots. You have to be much more careful. This here is one that I'm still umming and ahhing about as to whether or not it's a good idea. I wrote it here because it's a good idea, but maybe. We need to be quite careful about designing systems for filtering news. I'm always very skeptical when people say, I'm going to build a really trustworthy idea or a really trustworthy program, and it will filter the news for you, so long as you trust the program, which will never become corrupted. right? Because what happens is it becomes corrupted, and then someone else comes along and says, that was a terrible idea, all of you should trust my new program, which I've designed to be perfectly trustworthy, and so nothing will go wrong. Right? And this is a final one. I, I could do a whole hour on that by itself. We need to be very careful about news stories which are copying other news stories. News stories which has new content, that's good. Like, we should be promoting that. News stories which are just repeating what other people have said, and putting a new spin on it, we should be very careful, because those quite quickly, see, come to <sighs> We need to be very careful about journalism that's simply regurgitating other content, because that can very quickly spiral into echo chambers. So, anyway, I'm going to leave now before the Russians kill me. <laughs> you should come and say hi if you have any feedback. Uh, there's multiple different ways to contact me. If you have any malware, please be my guest. My inbox is always available. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.